move on to our final speaker of today. Dr. Rafael de Cabo. Right, thank you very much, Morton, Daniela, and Alex, for the invitation and you know for giving me the last session, the last talk of today. I think that um, one of the things that I learned through my career is you know to never give up, and it's like a message for all the uh, you know postdocs, postdocs, PhD students that I've been talking to through the last few days on the desperation of trying to finish a project or trying to get to the next stage. And then also, you know, during, during my career, one of the things that is the most satisfying is to see people that have gone through their lab in meetings and see how well they are doing. You know, I'm proud that Morton spent about a year and a half or two in our lab and we collaborated throughout his stay in the NIA and it's wonderful to see you laboring your own path. So I'm super proud of you. So I'm gonna to try to um, give you a snapshot of the study of longitudinal energy on mice and some of the prediction and associations with the lifespan and health span that we're measuring in this study. And I'm, trying, I'm gonna to try to explain why we, study, we studied this study. And I cannot tell you how many times I have regretted the onset of the study. All right, so in the Translational Gerontology Branch, which was funded in the, two, in the 2014, when I became the, um, the branch chief, we we're focusing a lot in nutrition, genes, and environment, and how an organism of a cell is able to capture the information that is out there, and using signaling molecules that they are normally always related to bioenergetics and energy metabolism, orchestrate a number of changes that articulate uh, molecular pathways that they are responsible for stress resistance, or oxidative stress, and adaptive uh, mechanisms. One of the things also that we're very interested in is to try to understand how altering the upper part of this can we get readouts that they're important for health span lifespan, and also stress resistance or resilience. Um, when you talk to physicians and when you look at the geroscience hypothesis, one thing that you realize is that you have different aspects of the aging process. So there is a biological aging that occurs from the moment of conception and is carried forward. And there are sort of like stages in biological aging that you have areas where you can completely compensate for any type of insult. And as you move time, you see that you start seeing changes in biological aging that cannot be reversed. And I think that that leads to the changes, the phenotypic changes that we see with aging. And then as phenotypic changes accumulate, then you get changes in functional aging. And towards the end of life, you have a, an area where you have phenotypic and functional decompensation that ends up to death. In pictures, when you are a kid, you can recover very quickly from almost anything. As you go through your teens, you may recover, your parents may not. When you make it to the 50s, you can see that the, there is an expansion of the changes in the phenotypes. And people that are sitting in this room, some of us look 40, some of us lose 50, 70, but nobody really knows what is your true age unless you look at the passport. And then as you get late in life, this heterogeneity seems to be increasing. And the interesting thing is when you look at old people, old cells, this heterogeneity that you see in the phenotypes is also reflected often at the molecular level. And that's the uniqueness of the individual, the organism, and each cell in your body. So this is fantastic in humans, but in mice, what happens? So in mice, we have them in cages. They are always with a constant nutrition that has not changed throughout the whole entire lifespan. You have the same, often you have the same genetic makeup and you have no alterations or no challenges from the environment. And yet, 
you don't have a perfectly a square curve where you have all the animals that start living and then all of a sudden one day all of them died at once. So even though when you keep things that they are so important for the aging process like this, you have this change in the outcomes of the aging process that we really do not understand entirely. So when I was talking with the physicians and the epidemiologists, for me it was really hard you know, to comprehend how this phenotypic heterogeneity was happening at the level of a population. So I decided to look at 24-month black six uh, B6 mice. So these are very commonly used mice in the aging field. And we took about 400 of them. We look at body weight. We look at glucose. We look at the insulin and HOMA. And what you can see here, this is like a huge heterogeneity of these animals. And they are, again, same genotype, same sex, same animal caretakers, same everything. To me, what's very intriguing is the question is, this guy over here has been like that all his life? Or did this just happen as a deterioration of the aging process? Is this guy here, or this group of mice, doing better or worse than the others? And how will this predict outcomes? So this is physiology, but what about function? Are the mice also different functionally? So you look at rotor rod, you look at grip strength, or you put the animals in a metabolic cage and you look at activity, you can also see that there's a huge spread of the ability of these animals to function. So even though you are in a very well-controlled environment, you are observing changes that they are across the board in these organisms. Now, B6 mice at 24 month old as are about the age of 75 year old in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging. So we looked, and if you look at the spread of body weight, you know, these curves look quite similar. So the distribution of the population seems quite uh, normal. The other thing that I was very interested about knowing this when I saw this data is what are we doing in the field when you order mice from the Jackson lab and you're the five mice, which ones are you getting? Are you getting this? Are you getting those? Or are you getting something in between? Very likely you are ordering from a vendor. They are gonna send you the best looking mice that they're gonna be able to make the trip. Because if not, they're gonna have to send you more mice because the ones that they send you, they die. So often we're working and doing experiments with animals that they are not out of the norm. Okay, so working with Ali David Allison, we decided to say, to look at what will be, you know, an, a, an N that is appropriate to find either 10, 20, 30, or 40, or 50% difference in that cohort of mice, okay? And what is, to me, incredibly uh, impressive was if you look at these numbers, I'm just gonna blow them up because it's incredible. If you look, if you want to see changes in body weight of 20% or 30%, you're talking about having to order a number of animals that is way above what we normally use as an N in our studies. If you want to look at difference in insulin, forget about it. You're not going to be able to see it. So when we do interventions and when we do any type of study in the animals, we need to figure out exactly what are we doing, how many animals we need, and how we're gonna do the distribution and baseline and how many type of these measurements we need to do. So to try to understand how these animals get here, we came up after discussing with a lot of people with this study of longitudinal aging in mice. So when you go in the literature and you look at mouse aging, often you find two time points, maybe three time points in a study. Normally it's two, two to three months of age, 12 months and 24 months. These mice tend to live between 36 to 40 months of age. So we're ignoring 12 months of the, age of the life of these animals. So this, the methods is published in JGBS, but basically we took two strains of mice, males and females, 900 animals per strain and sex, divided in 19 different cohorts, 50 animals per cohort, and we took them throughout the whole entire lifespan. During the last span, we measure things every other week, a three-month interval and six-month intervals, 
And these are the parameters that we measure throughout. And then cross-sectionally, to try to get information about what was brewing in the background, we did some challenges like OGTT, ITT, and then we have a scheduled euthanasia to be able to collect tissues for biochemistry, histology, and multiomics. This is not the focus of today, but to give you a flavor of body weight, food consumption, and body temperature, we have about 89,000 data points for each one of these variables. And the list goes on through all of these, and we have a very talented um, uh, biostatistician that is doing amazing work trying to understand how these variables are connected throughout the aging process. And this paper hopefully will be out not very, um, not too late. So if you look at the SLAM project, so you have at the core the two sexes and both strains, then you have a collections of tissues and the slides, feces, serum, urine, and then as you move in the outer rings, you have more um, parameters that they measure throughout the whole entire study. We're doing lots of deep learning, machine learning, and bioinformatics. And what we wanted to see is what is the interactions between the biological metrics, the phenotypic metrics, the functional metrics, and the demographic metrics. Having such a large population, you can also start studying, you know, the mice are a group house. You can start studying things that often you cannot do in a smaller set of studies. Then we're going to have a number of resources through our website that we're building. There will be a biorepository, molecular, I mean, there is a biorepository. There are molecular markers, phenotype, necropsy database, and histology repository. And then this cannot be done without a huge amount of people and undertake by the whole entire institute. So one of the challenges that we did with the SLAM was try to ask the question, can we find aging biomarkers in the mice that correlate to human and they're useful and easy to make and to process in the clinic? So Jorge Martinez Romero, a postdoc from Spain, is aged, but not because of the postdoc, he got there late. And he decided to, do, to look just at regular CBC and a couple of other parameters that are measured just with a scale and a glucometer, meter and try to figure out if we can do a block clock. So this is basically a block clock that you can build. It was built and you can measure in about 15 minutes if you have a participant scale, blood glucose, and a CVC machine. So what he did is he took some of the block parameters to predict the block age. Then he calculated the aging acceleration and the clinical implication in terms of the survival. The way that he did is he developed a machine learning pipeline to clean and split the, um, the data. He got uh, 70 to uh, produce the uh, deep neuronal network and 30 to, test, to do the blood testing, and that should give us a blood age. What was fascinating is if you look at the error that we get is that we are able to predict with all the 12,000 observations that we use about, with an accuracy of about 10 weeks, the age of an animal, and with a very nice regression. If you look, just at a validation, so this is a pool of all cohorts, so we just took a subpopulation of every single cohort that we have, and you can see that the R square is maintained, and then if you do a, um, just two independent cohorts, you also get the same type of response. The one thing that is good about the SLAM is that you have three different strains in the study, so you can start looking at things divided by sex, so if you look and divide by sex using the three strains or in females or males, you can see clearly that you know, our error is very, very similar. So we are extremely accurate with this, uh, with this clock. If you look at strain, you can divide it by the diversity of red mice, the B6 or the head 3 and you can see that the um, R score doesn't change that much. And in the EO, DO, for example, the accuracy of the clock is quite impressive. The other thing that you can do with this is now to think, because we have, like, unlike most other clocks, we do have the lifespan of these animals. So we know each one of these animals when he died. So now I can ask the clock, okay, take these animals that you have up here and these animals that you have back here, what does the lifespan of them look like? And what you can see here, if you divide it by tertials, you can see that the short-lived animals, the ones that they are, 
with accelerated aging or decelerated aging, they have very distinct lifespan curves, which is good. And it doesn't matter if you use all the animals or you use a subset of the validation of the animals, you see this clear separation between the two uh, cohorts. The other thing that you can do now is also to look actually at acceleration, is that the age of these two cohorts are accelerated. You can see clearly that the long-lived mice, they have a slower aging process. You can also calculate in individual mice what is the prediction for maximal lifespan, and you can see that we can clearly distinguish in each individual mice with just six or seven data points, we can predict the maximum survival. So that's quite nice. So now what we're trying to do is trying to understand what is the minimum amount of data points that we need to predict maximum survival. Can we do it within three months or six months of collecting data points so we can then test uh, interventions that will alter this trajectory and predict outcomes of health and survival. The other thing that we can do, because now we can separate the group by short or long-lived animals, we can now identify animals and decide backwards how many data points we need, for example, to run proteomics or metabolomics. So we just finished running 448 samples of seven time points, eight samples per time point, two blood, glu two blood glucose levels, two sexes, two strains. And in each one of these data points, we also have cross-sectionally livers and muscle of some of the animals that they were included in this clock. So with these, we have done transcriptomics uh, in the muscle and the liver, and we have also done proteomics. With the proteomics, we're using a technology developed by Sears and is in collaboration with a tenure track investigator, uh, Nate Basisti, that came from the Back Institute. And we have run 896 samples, six samples per mile of both strains and sexes. And what you see is that we can get now with this technology about the cumulative about 4,300 proteins, but the average per sample has been about 2,400 proteins, which is quite good for mouse serum. The problem that we have with the SLAM is when the data come, is data pours. You, you have now 7.7 .7 terabytes of data of just these samples, and we're running four times that number quite soon. So I think within the, this year, 2024, which you have 4,000 4, samples run of proteomics of the serum. So what we hope is to be able to predict outcomes combining the information from transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics, and the phenotypic characterization to really develop predictors of outcomes of health and survival in the mouse. So to give you an example, you can basically choose a given predictor that comes up for the proteomics or the metabolomics. You can have associations and call it the Bradley, that is the person that is doing the analysis, Z-score, and you can identify whether that protein or the metabolite is having like a linear chain with H up, up, down, or a combination of the two. So the future direction that we have is we really want to expand our depth assessment of metabolomics uh, with longitudinal serum across uh, the anchor sectional samples, increase the number of um, samples, time points, and tissues. We need to process the serum proteomics for the current data dataset, tissue transcriptomics, and we are working in the integrative analysis of all the data, which is extremely challenging both because of the amount of data and because there is no really real tools to do multi-omics in combination with the phenotypic outcomes. And of course, everything is, will be compared and combined with the immense data set that Luigi Ferrucci has been developing over the last 20 years of the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging to try to understand which of these parameters are comparable across species and which are human-specific and mouse specific. Islam, I think, is defining the longitudinal trajectories of change in aging phenotypes. And I think that for the field, that is going to be extremely useful. And I cannot believe that I'm going to say this, but we're going to do Islam too, that we're going to do another cohort of animals with different interventions to now that we know the normal trajectories of aging, 
how long does it take a given intervention to alter them and into what direction those will be altered. Morton has seen this sunset that looks beautiful, but as you well know, this is all because of pollution, all these um, beautiful red colors over Baltimore. I cannot do this without an incredible team of people, of everybody that works in the Translational Gerontology Branch, um, continuous support of everybody that I have mentioned along the presentation, and multiple collaborators that they are both in the U.S. and across the pond. Morton, thank you. Thank you so much, Rafa. That's a gargantuan uh, undertaking. I remember when you started this crazy project. 2015. Yes. That's why I yeah. left in 2016. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Amazing work. Um, we have time for maybe one question. There's one down here. Hello. Oh, um, fantastic um, talk, as always. Um, I was wondering, so if I understood correctly, you are, um, with some parameters, able to predict uh, total lifespan uh, by five weeks. Yeah, no. It's not? Ten weeks. Ten weeks. Um, I guess, like, doesn't this suggest that something is already in a, quite, quite early in life, is already in creating this trajectory, and that the small I mean, changes that are happening later in life are not uh, that relevant. If you could comment on, on that, at least in these conditions. So it's in some of the variables. So we have identified several variables that they are very good at predicting outcomes of health and survival very early on in life and also very late in life. The, they are the trajectories of the animals as they grow to the first year of age and the ones post two years of age are the best predictors, the changes in those trajectories. In the middle, there is a lot of changes and adaptation to the aging process that they are super important that we do not understand really well. Uh, I love the talk uh, by Spickman earlier of how important is to understand trajectories and how important is to understand how the animals are behaving within their environment. One of the things that we have seen across the three strains, both sexes, if these animals, for example, starting about 17 months of age, they start losing weight and that loss of weight is just fat. And at the time that they start losing weight, they start increasing food consumption by two years of age. 20, between 24 and 26 months of age, the animals weight about 40% less than they used to weight, a peak body weight, and they are eating twice as much. So when we do interventions and we are providing the food and the chemical in the, in the food, we have to be very careful to adjust as you go. So these are things that they are popping out that I was not expecting that I think are going to have huge you know, consequences when we try to interpret some of the data that we are collecting that, or we have collected. John, one last one. A very, very exciting talk. Um, do, do you know whether there are any uh, transgenerational longevity effects? Have you seen any of that? That's a fantastic question. And we are planning an experiment that would hopefully take care of that. All right, thank you so much, Rafa, yep. that was amazing. <laughs>